Great. Hello, everyone. Very good afternoon, good evening, good morning. This is Rahul Bagadia. I'm Chairman Managing Director at P Manifold. And uh, I welcome you today for this uh, uh, webinar. Uh, at P Manifold, we have been organizing this series, EV Charging Ahead, for last uh, couple of years now. And for this particular webinar, I am so glad uh, we are doing in joint association with uh, uh, UN Environment uh, Copenhagen Climate Center. The short uh, acronym is UNEP CCC. Uh, so this uh, study uh, focusing on intracity and intercity feasibility at uh, Ghana uh, is jointly undertaken by P Manifold and uh, UNEP Triple C and with University of Ghana. And uh, uh, we are glad to share this study and its outcomes with the hope that the learnings and the process that was undertaken will become useful to many more cities and countries, especially when many of the developing cities, growing cities uh, are in the first stages of uh, uh, deploying e-buses. Yeah? So that, that is the whole objective of uh, today's webinar. Again, I welcome you all uh, and all my fellow speakers. I want to set a brief context of this uh, uh, webinar. And uh, of course, after introducing the speakers, and uh, then my colleague Sayali will present the detailed feasibility study. And then we will undertake uh, panel discussions between all the uh, experts that we have uh, uh, in today's webinar. Can we share the screen, please? Yeah, great. Full screen, please. Next slide. So I think on a positive note, uh, the overall globally, EVs are growing up. And in particular, the e-bus segment uh, in EVs is uh, rapidly kind of growing up. We have close to 600,000 uh, uh, e-buses already operating on road uh, in the world. And by 2040, it is expected that this number will grow 1.3 million, uh, possibly even higher. So that is uh, the quantum uh, this particular uh, bus segment uh, has taken. There were apprehensions at a point that it will be costlier, it is bigger, it will have its own operational technology challenges. But I think the industry, the government uh, have really come together to make this uh, uh, vehicle segment uh, successful electrification adoption. And I think the next will of course be truck following the uh, e-buses. If you see like what regions have made the best uh, uh, advent uh, into uh, uh, e-buses, then the lead most is uh, China, followed by Europe, uh, India, US, and then followed by the rest of the world. So these are the regions which have seen the highest penetration of uh, uh, EVs. And uh, in today's discussion, I particularly want to bring about a flavor of a developing country like Ghana. Uh, what are its challenges? what is uh, a technical uh, and commercial model of e-buses that is more applicable for Ghana and what similarities it may have for the other uh, uh, emerging cities and countries is what we will uh, take a look. World over, there are a lot of new advancements, new business models uh, that, that are uh, taking up. If I have to cite an example, India recently went for a very high order more than uh, uh, 5,000 plus uh, uh, e-buses centralized procurement, uh, which is one of the world's biggest standard. And I think uh, uh, it is attempting to go with uh, 50,000 and beyond uh, uh, going forward. So there are a lot of advancements that has happened uh, uh, in this sector. Next, please. Uh, with the advancements, I think there are challenges also that are getting faced with the deployment of e-buses. 
I just want to use a very brief view, like what are some of these challenges now that are getting known with more and more uh, eBus deployments. One uh, uh, issue that we have seen globally is like there is sometimes a less detailed planning done at a city level before we start procurement and tendering. Yeah, so sometimes uh, that that is the challenge we are facing and that lack of planning is resulting into issues when you are into the setup and commissioning space. So we plan less for the space for uh, buses, parking, their charging but we miss upon the planning for enough space for the charges that will be required uh, for installing charges and for right uh, bus uh, uh, parking. So there are scenarios where uh, for a bigger deployment there are charges lying, but uh, then installations is not done because not enough space uh, was really right of uh, kind of planned. Uh, sometimes there is not sync with the electricity provider and getting that uh, high voltage connection in your depot uh, becomes a challenge. And sometimes if you are able to get the wiring uh, and distribution transformer, then there is a lot of hassle around like what tariffs, uh, uh, any special EV tariffs that uh, need to come for e-buses. Yeah, so a lot of agency issues kind of uh, happens uh, uh, in, in that space. And if you look onto the operation side, the foremost issue is around the battery size planning and how does battery perform over the life of the bus, right? Uh, the bus is undergoing different kind of stresses in its daily operations and a uh, lot of it, its influence on the battery will be different under a uh, otherwise controlled test lab situations. Uh, this results into some unknown behaviors uh, and faster deterioration of battery life and which results into a lot of issues related to the range anxieties, uh, related to change of the uh, charging schedules, then you start missing your trips uh, and then the contract starts getting penalized the operators and then again there are a lot of agency issues that starts between the PTA and the eBus operator and the charge point operators. Uh, so the foremost point in all this to avoid such hassles is to really do a solid uh, techno-commercial planning before we start uh, with the deploy procurement and deployment of the e-buses. So with this, uh, let's move next forward. Uh, in today's discussions, now having seen what are the opportunities that eBus is providing at a past emerging landscape and what are some of the challenges that are getting uh, more known with uh, many deployments, I think in today's discussions we have uh, 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 very good experts uh, with whom we have worked uh, uh, on the Ghana study and uh, 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 with them we want to discuss this views like how at a national government level what kind of prioritization is put to PT and its uh, greener uh, electrification, how government is looking for kind of supporting uh, right budgets and sub, uh, uh, fiscal incentives and funding for the pilots, then going at an operator level what is an operator perspective of transitioning from the existing fossil mode to electrification and how do they build up its internal capacity to catch up with the electrification thing. Then uh, uh, experts from development agency sharing their perspective like uh, how eBus financing is being looked upon by multilaterals, by international agencies, by private investors and what can Ghana and similar emerging countries uh, kind of uh, do uh, after taking care of the first feasibility study. And uh, of course, understanding all this in context of the uh, case study of Ghana, but with a broader uh, 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 representation to other countries. Next, please. So with this, let me introduce our uh, today's uh, 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 experts with us. We have with us uh, Mr. Daniel Essel. Uh, Daniel is a Deputy Director, Ministry of Transport at Ghana. Uh, and very instrumental. We have received huge support from Daniel and his team in terms of review of our work and uh, uh, ensuring that we have all the right data points 
and thinking about what business models uh, uh, will really work in uh, uh, Khana. So I welcome you, Daniel, uh, to the webinar today. Uh, then we have Mr. David Techie. Uh, he is from Metro Mass Transit Limited, MMTL. So they are the operators who are running currently conventional uh, buses uh, in Ghana and also in the capital city, Accra. Uh, David, uh, I, my team is still working with David. He is still facing some technical challenge to join. I hope that by the time we enter into the final discussion, David is uh, able to join uh, with us. Uh, then we have uh, Subhash Dhar, uh, he's senior researcher at uh, UNEP uh, uh, CCC and uh, he has been a fellow uh, colleague with whom we have worked uh, uh, this detailed uh, feasibility study uh, for government of Ghana. Welcome uh, Subhash. And uh, then we have uh, Dr. Ernest Agyamang, uh, he's a senior lecturer from University of Ghana another partner with whom we uh, worked uh, and carried out this uh, pre-feasibility study. So this, these are the experts uh, in today's uh, uh, webinar. I am joined by my uh, colleague Sayali, uh, who worked with me and team uh, in actually carrying out uh, this study uh, in capital city of Ghana, Accra, and its adjacent city, Kumasi, for intercity planning. So let Sayali uh, first give us uh, a few top level view on uh, the pre-feasibility and the process that was uh, uh, undertaken. And then we start with the panel discussions with our experts. Uh, over to you, Saeed. Uh, hello, Saeed. Sally, we cannot hear you. Hello, Sally. Just give us a second for us to uh, look into it, please. So my apologies, uh, I think uh, Sile is uh, joining back. In the meantime, uh, let, let me take you forward into the discussion. And once Sile joins, uh, she will take it uh, forward. Can we have the presentation shared? Yes, Ravi. One second. Hello. Yeah, please uh, share the presentation. Am I audible? Yes, you are yes. audible, sir. Thank you. Is, I, is my screen also visible to you? Yeah, you can start, Sile. Here and see is fine. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. So, yeah. Thanks, thanks everyone for joining us today in this wonderful webinar on eBus planning. Firstly, I'll take you through our methodology for eBus feasibility with the case study of Ghana. So, yeah, moving ahead. So, as we all know, that eBus are more complex than the conventional buses from all the perspectives you see, like from planning, procurement, and the operation standpoint as well. Because if you know that uh, as conventional buses can be refilled in a few minutes, 
or uh, can easily complete the schedule without even refilling but in case of ebus it has a limited range and that's what it brings the complexity and also when we look into the batteries which are into the ebus are they are heavier and they negatively affect efficiency of buses efficiency we mean to say like uh, kwh consume per kilometer so going deeper into like our e, e bus efficiency uh, what we have observed that e bus is highly sensitive to all the parameters of terrain temperature traffic etc and therefore we have started our analysis with the duty cycle collection so after uh, route and depot selection so here our aim is to calculate firstly a real world energy consumption so what we do here is basically by capturing all real world data that is lat long speed distance through the ic vehicle and simulate it in the scilab and uh, this is like very important analysis which we call it as the heart of our study and many a times we move with the thumb rule also and uh, this thumb rules also can create a deviation so that is why uh, the energy consumption modeling is important uh, so that there will be no hassles and uh, such detailing can prevent a breakdown in a trip and all that in light of this so after that once we are done with the energy consumption our next task is the battery sizing so here we uh, come to know that what is the required battery size for my uh, this particular study so what we basically do here is uh oh my my screen has stopped for a minute okay so basically uh, in this uh, battery sizing we will come to know the required battery size and here for calculating that battery size we will also further detail it out that how we exactly do but there are various factors which we take into consideration like route level energy consumption daily operation then also a reserve ratio like we have in the ic also we have to keep some minimum charge in the battery and the aging factor and all so that is how we reach to a battery sizing and uh, then we come to a charging strategy so like charging play a very important role in this ebus planning so basically there are three questions which we need to answer where to charge when to charge and how to charge so for that we formulate different scenarios using uh, many operational requirements and uh, then based on uh, those scenario formulation we come to the optimum level where we are getting uh, where all uh, a big scenario is matching with the all the operational requirement and which is having the minimum infra cost so that is what we consider as the best one for our case and then after uh, we come to the overall infra and investment sizing and the deployment plan for scaling up with the help of like tco and all this so this is how the broad step which we carry for this ebus planning now we'll take you through this step with the case study of ghana so here we have just given the landscape broad landscape of ghana so firstly to know about the ghana uh here as we can see uh, there are currently 33 buses per lakh population but as per the global standard we need 60 buses per lakh population so what we can see is for each lakh we need at least 30 buses and uh, this gap is what creating a uh, service quality issue and which is hampering ultimately into the model share and as a result we can see here there is only five, less than 5% of the model share per bus uh this is also a mode share graph where uh, we can see the bus mode share is less than 5% but the trotos which are the kind of informal public transport in ghana 15 seaters and uh, are available at very good frequency they are contributing to almost like uh, 30 to 35% and when we are looking into uh, accra the national capital out of total number of registered vehicles 50% are into accra and uh, when we are looking in the current ebus services there are no current ebus services and uh, national e mobility road map has recommended 1000 intra city and 300 intra city buses by 2030 so basically uh, this transition to ebus will have the opportunity to improve city's emission and the mobility pattern also 
towards sustainability and this is supported by many like ev road maps and the other policies in the khana and uh, here on the right side what we have shown is the intra city and the inter city bus map so here you can see all the, there are almost 14 to 15 routes in khan akra uh intra city and for inter city here we have mapped the akra kumasi route and uh, then the uh, from all these routes we have chosen only two routes for our e bus feasibility and there were some selection criteria for that so i uh, what i will say that there are many uh, like this depot and route selection includes many other considerations like commercial technical operational here we have listed few and of course it is supported by a state broader stakeholder consultation and then we have reached to the point of depo and route selection so this is how the broad landscape and uh, now we are starting with our first step that is energy consumption modeling towards e buses so for those selected routes which we have identified first is the to do to adenta and then to do to tema r1 and r2 this is 18 kilometers and this is 36 kilometers so what we have done first is we have collected the duty cycle and the passenger loading data for those selected routes uh, this was collected using the existing ic buses only and uh, we have collected during the peak hour and uh, then energy uh, route energy for those duty cycles has been calculated using uh, the simulation model various simulation model which we have inbuilt in our p manifold and uh, as we can see in this figure here we have tried to show the impact of ac on and off over energy consumption for both of this route so as you can see here total energy consumption for adenta to do and tema to do which we have later used for our battery sizing so our next step is battery sizing so uh, using the output of what we have received in the energy consumption model we have considered uh and considering like dod soc reserve ratio aging factor uh we have done the soc assessment for the available market available models first is 250 kwh battery model which was for tata ultra buses and uh, that we have taken and we have done the soc assessment and what we have found for that is in this tema to do route our uh, soc is depleting to less than 10% and it is uh, recommended that uh, soc below 20% is severely harming the bus performance and therefore we are going with the next available 324 model so here we are getting uh, in both the case adequate soc so as to and the lesser is so as to complete my full trip uh without the opportunity charging and uh, in here uh, we have observed that only in case of r2 my soc is getting depreciated but still we have chosen this uh, 324 this is because uh, from many of our stakeholder consultation and the oems expert we got to know that for initial first deployment and to avoid mix of uh, models we are we have taken this uh, 324 kwh battery into account and uh, once we are done with the battery sizing then our next task is and here we are finalizing 324 uh, for further assessment of the charging strategy and the fleet scheduling then we are coming to a charging uh, strategy where our major question to answer is when where and how and uh, based on that uh, based on like which scenario we have formulated different scenario and which scenario is giving me the meeting my operational requirement with the minimum operational cost i will be considering uh, that as my charging strategy so here we have given the details of uh, summary of the first deployment for this to do tema to do route so out of various formulated scenario this is the scenario which we have considered that is charging at tema depot only so for one buses here i will first show this is my tema depot and this is my uh, to do depot and it is 36 kilometers with uh, one hour and 15 15 minutes so what we can see that for one uh, for one e bus uh, i can complete three round trips with the charging full charging at tema depot only and 
uh, I will require total of 216 kilometers uh, of per day with uh, uh, the energy consumption as well. And uh, this, I will be able to make whole three trips, one trip uh, up in and will need a full charge at Tema Depot for around one hour and 15 minutes. So this is how for one bus first we have planned and uh, for forward trip I'll need uh, 80 kWh of uh, energy consumption and for backward trip it is 72 kWh of energy consumption and considering this one e-bus parameters then we are coming to uh, 25 e-buses which was our requirement here we are considering 8 to 10 percent as reserve plate so two we have kept as reserve plate and for that then we have calculated that how many parking bays and the number of charges i required for my tema depot because i am going to charge at tema depot only and then what is my uh, charging utilization as well so what we have found that for this 25 buses uh, 25 plus 2 buses all over will be parked at this tema depot so i will need 27 bays with the seven number of charges and this is giving me a 15 percent of charging utilization throughout the day with the e-bus utilization of 45 percent so this is just the glimpse of the output what we have got and uh, thorough analysis has been done for this particular output and similar analysis has been performed for all other routes like adenta to do route with various scenario formulation and the city route as well which was Accra to Kumasi 250 kilometers and uh, then for those that particular route here we are giving the total cost of ownership and the business model so what we have observed that uh, e bus without fiscal incentive is having a 1.2 USD per kilometer and uh, with this is without fiscal incentive whereas ic bus will have around 0.9 and uh, hence there is a lack of parity which is uh, what we have understood is the major barrier for uh, e bus penetration and therefore uh, we are going with uh, and with the help of all these government interventions which are recommended in the national ev roadmap we can come to a point where we will get uh, the parity of e-bus with the IC bus and uh, then it will be an easier adoption in the market as well. So this is the TCO analysis of only one route what we have shown which has, this is, which has included all the infra cost and the physical infra as well as operation, capex, maintenance, etc. everything. And uh, then we are coming to a business model. So firstly we have identified uh, what are the roles and responsibilities for the business model and who which agency can take that role basically and uh, we have got these are uh, like for ebus planning the roles and responsibility are investment ownership operation maintenance then charger as well and then finally who, who will take the revenue the ticketing part so for that we have identified the actors and uh, we have suggested the rationale for those actors. So, uh, for investment, since it is heavy investment and uh, just uh, investment by government will be difficult. So, attracting sufficient private player will be uh, is very important here. But since this is the huge capital investment required, we are we have we have thought of formulating SPV, which will be a combination of MMPL which is the bus operator there and the government of Ghana together uh, with the donor agency. So they will basically invest. Then my ownership due to, uh, since this is very new space and the new technology and many of the operator and the authority are not familiar with this technology, I'll need the new task force like SPV. So we are proposing this SPV and this has, uh, and then uh, for the maintenance also, uh, since only with the help of operator and the SPV, we are adding here OEM to upskill my operators because they will have the expert and this is the first deployment. So this is how we are proposing for the maintenance part of the e-buses and charges and finally a ticketing. And uh, this is how first thought we have given on the business model, which is letter, which is also been reviewed by many 
stakeholders and uh, yeah similar analysis has been performed for different other routes as well and then overall impact has been calculated based on impact at, at the ghg level cost level how much is the cost for uh, deployment etc so yeah this was overall broad uh, thing what we have taken for the case study of kana thank you thank very you. much uh... Sahili, uh, uh, that was very good presentation and study undertaken. Uh, let me uh, pick up uh, first Ernest uh, from University of Ghana. Uh, Ernest, you are most closest to the ground, fairly deeply involved uh, with us conducting this study. Uh, what are some of the realities uh, on ground in Accra? uh that we are aware uh and under which things we have kind of really brought uh e-buses as an option to the accra city so if you can share some of uh, those realities with us and what's the kind of uh, preparation in the government in terms of its policy ecosystem to support e-buses uh Ernest. yeah thank you so much <clears throat> rahul um can you grant me the possibility to share my screen i just put some few visuals together for the benefit of yeah. our audience. Sure, sure. Uh, can we please let Ernest share his presentation? Yes, yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can you confirm if you can see my screen? Yes, yes, Ernest. Great. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Rahul. So you basically asked as to the realities on the ground. And so the next few slides, I want to share with you the context where we find ourselves, the challenges that public transport presently is bedeviled with, and then some policy responses. So uh, recently, a study that was published by the UN Agency on World Urbanization indicates that um, Sub-Saharan Africa is indeed fast urbanizing. Indeed, between 1970 and 2020, we are told that the human population that lives in these urban cities in Sub-Saharan Africa has grown from 51 million to some point of 50 million across uh, the continent. Similarly, in Ghana, um, names like Accra, the national capital, uh, Kumase, the second largest city, Sekenita Krade, Tamale, these are the most urbanized cities that you may come across. Now, re one reality on the ground that you're most likely to encounter is that most of these cities have poor spatial planning. And what do I mean by that? Generally, we seem to over-concentrate all the important trip-generating activities at the city center. If you look on your screen to your right, you see a map of um, the Greater Accra Metropolitan Area. This represents the old AMA, which is Accra Metropolitan Area, home to some 200, 2 million inhabitants, and the contiguously built up functionally interlinked neighborhoods. Um, to, the, to, to your east, you may see all the way from Teshi to the industrial city of Tema. Then to the west of the city center, uh, Accra Central, it goes all the way to Kaswa, which technically and functionally, um, you know, technically is in the central region of the country, but functionally, it is part and parcel of the city of Accra in terms of trips that people make to shop, um, to assess government services, and to do various socioeconomic undertakings. Uh, recently, I did a study um, in 2017, which was published in the Journal of Transport Geography, which indicates that a majority of people who actually come to Accra Central, the city's uh, city core, where most of the important facilities are found, a majority of them are living in the peri-urban areas. So for instance, if you go to, again to the west of the city core, you may find Kaswa, as I already explained, it is in the central region, but functionally, it is part of the the, the conurbation called Gamma, Greater Accra Metropolitan Area. This is a settlement that's close about 30 kilometers in terms of the trip that people make by road transport uh, primarily. Now to the east of the core, 
you may find Tishi. That's also another major community along the beach road all the way through to the industrial uh, port city of Tema. Again, a lot of people travel um, distances close to about 20 kilometers just to get to the CBD to engage in economic activities. Now, if you come to the northern part of the city core, where you have Medina, for instance, you're having a lot of people also moving in there. But even beyond Medina, if you, for those of you, the local context, from Medina towards Adenta, if you just keep going straight through Pantan, um, or Yarefa, Ayimensa, you realize that, so, you know, for the benefit of our international audience, if you look down, you see a photograph of these newly emerging gated communities. These communities are being built on an initially you know um untapped area the abri mountains which are supposed to separate accra from the eastern region is being encroached on so you have an incident of urban sprawl most people are living at, at very distant locations from the trip destinations which are usually uh found in, in the city center now the question would be how do people move about in a city in terms of mobility patterns um Obviously, when you have this yawning gap between where people stay and where they come to work, where they come to shop, where they come to assess government services in the ministries, in the departments, the agencies of the ministry, uh, I mean, ministries area, and also within the commercial centers where you have the Makola uh, shopping mall and these other facilities, you are most likely going to engender auto dependency. And what do I mean by that? Given the sheer distances, people may have to come in one form of motorized transport or the other. Now, as you can see in the visuals, most um, a, a majority of the uh, public transport space is taken up by low occupancy vehicles. Uh, in terms of the share, I think over 80% of public mobility is done in trotros. These are mini, mini buses with a current capacity between 15 to 27, 30 uh, current capacity. Their maintenance culture is usually low, uh, emission from these vehicles are quite high to the extent that we are told that a little close to about 48 percent of greenhouse gases are emitted from our current public transport regime again traffic congestion it's a bane to the city's economic growth of course since 2003 the government of ghana has tried to improve uh, public movement including um, high occupancy um, ice buses we have the Metro Mass Transit, which was incorporated in 2003. Um, Mr. Takis, yes, we talked to this particular project. Then sometime in 2016, the Ayalolo BRT or QBS quality buses also joined on board. Now, in spite of these modest uh, improvements, and of course, I also need to add, I also have some minimal rail services, but if you compare, it does look like the market share of these formal bus and train services are quite negligible. Most of the trips are made in trotters or in private cars or sometimes on informal options like uh, motor taxis, as you can see, what we locally refer to as Okada, or shared taxis, or in more recent times, the transport network companies, ride hailing companies like Uber, Yango, and Bolt also coming on board. And so congestion really is a problem and all the issues with, you know, depending on fossil fuel. So of course, we are told from studies that Ghana, per the business as usual scenario, may be emitting close to about 74 metric tons CO2 equivalent of greenhouse gases by 2050. So what has been a policy response? And, and I'll be brief on this one. Governments of Ghana has pledged to reduce emissions between 15 to 45% below the uh, business as usual scenario. And this has been done against the backdrop of some international commitment. As you are aware, Ghana is signatory to the Paris Agreement, which among other things, we want to you know, cut down our greenhouse gas emissions and also our overly dependence on fossilized fuels. Now, the second overarching importance where Ghana is tilting towards um, e-bus, um, you know, revolution is the fact that presently Ghana exceeds in terms of energy production. We have more energy than we actually using. And so, for instance, um, studies published by the Energy Commission indicate that. Um, within our peak load, you know, the demand is around 2,000 megawatts. Meanwhile, we are producing close to 5,000 megawatts of energy. So the government of Ghana intends to, to, to productively soak up the existing uh, energy capacity that we have. So, of course, we do admit that challenges do exist. And I think the panelist, uh, Mr. Issa, is around from the ministry. Mr. Taki, also from the operator perspective, will shed a lot of light on the challenges. But 
Um, Rahul, if you ask me as to what the realities are, these are the realities. We have, you know, a land use special arrangement which promotes auto dependency and not more vehicles on the road uh, because we have centralized everything at the city core. And then most of the trips are made with, you know, low occupancy, poorly emitting uh, mode of transport. And so government want to do something about it. And I think it, it, is, it is something that is laudable that we all need to give um, our support towards. Rahul, if you can take, take it over from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ernest. Uh, thank you for bringing uh, those real pictures plus opportunities as well as you said. And I think energy remains a very important enabler uh, exactly. for e-mobility. And I think Ghana is standing at a good point uh, in terms uh, uh, of at least the electricity. Like otherwise, it becomes a challenge for many of the countries. Of course, Ghana needs to start moving to more uh, cleaner electricity uh, mm. to get the best uh, advantage of uh, EVs. Uh, so Daniel, I think uh, this brings a very uh, great uh, moving to you, uh, Daniel. Uh, you represent uh, Ministry of Transport, uh, have been very deeply involved in bringing a lot of reforms uh, in transport. Uh, one of the question, Daniel, that uh, most of the countries, uh, not just developing, but even developed countries face, uh, is the prioritization at a national level to bring focus on expanding and improving public transportation and its greening and its electrification. So as government of Ghana, uh, how do you place, uh, how do government uh, looks upon uh, public transport uh, and its uh, greening uh, to the electrification initiative. Where does public transport bus systems and its uh, electrification uh, uh, get positioned? Daniel. Okay, Rahul, well, um, thank you very much. And I think uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Ernest uh, um, He has really laid down some of the basic understanding and what is going on within the sector but in brief and, and in summary in, uh, trying to come up with some of the challenges that uh, is facing our circumstances i think the key issue is the institutional lapses institutional challenges vis-a-vis -vis operational standard for public transport vehicles i mean we understand that the transition to electric uh, buses is not simply a leapfrog uh, exercise. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, and you need the coordination both from the private and the public sector in order to make uh, this work. You need to look at the policies, the institutional framework, the regulations and standards, and how all these uh, play together to make the e mobility agenda uh, very uh, positive. It is clear that it is. Um, we really don't have a solid institutional framework and a good intelligence coordination to make uh, EVs work work for us. Uh, in, in that sense, um, that was why we, we sought certain assistance. But to the more substantive issues, uh, Dr. Enes Ajima have raised it already, but the bottom line is we have very poor transport, transportation management practices. The operations are said that individuals own the vehicles and as a control on revenue, the deployment of the buses, the assignment, and all that. And the individuals more or less are being controlled by the unions. And in some instances, the unions are then responsible for the assignment of these buses. So there's no issue of uh, accountability and transparency in the way uh, we, we uh, they operate. Another issue I want to also come up with is our procurement practices and 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 in principle our focus is is, is on at least cost basis and it's not a joke e, e buses are quite expensive so for the private sector or any government entity wanting to veer into e buses the first point of consideration is the initial campus and and in this case it's, it's very huge so unless there are compelling reasons it is really challenging for any institution to venture into uh, e uh, procurement. So these are some of the issues that uh, we, we, we've come up with. From the operator's pers perspective, it, it is 
really challenging to uh, venture into e-bars because once their books are so bad, they don't have proper accounting systems to, to make uh, e-bars work. Then you also have to look at in terms of enforcement, the issues of standards, and even public awareness on, 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 on EBAS. These are all issues that we, we need to tackle. I mean, let's face it, EBAS is expensive. And that's why uh, for the government and for the ministry, our argument is that there should be some form of subsidies or incentives because these are necessary. And these are necessary to support uh, their introduction. You are looking at financing, and in terms of financing, are we going into e bars with commercial facilities or concession facilities, cheap credit? These are things that are key considerations for any operator or any venture that want to go into e buses. Now, the key issue here is the fiscal infrastructure, and Dr. Ness have uh, mentioned some of them, but for any bus services to operate, you need some level of uh, facilities to make it work. And level of facilities, I'm referring to some bus lanes, uh, some charging infrastructures, dedicated facilities, depots. These are all complementary facilities that are required to make uh, them uh, break even. If you put those two competing modes, ICE and buses on the same platform, in a mixed traffic condition, um, it, it's not worth a business uh, venturing into. Then uh, another issue that Doc has already raised, I think, is the issue of the charging infrastructure. And, and clearly, we have seen some deployment of charging infrastructure uh, within the country, um, but mainly these are for. Uh, M1, M2 vehicles, I mean cars, taxis, and not higher occupancy buses. But we really need that level of infrastructure. It's like a chicken and egg issue. You need that infrastructure to encourage uh, the, 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 the uptake. And at the heart of, of, of this EV discussion is access to uh, cheap and reliable energy. Doc already mentioned that we have uh, excess capacity. But in principle, yes, we have excess capacity, but the energy itself is not reliable. You have a situation where um, you cannot predict whether the next day you have uh, uh, energy for, for your services. So the predictability of the energy is, is a big situation uh, for, for us. Um, on the operator side, and I'm sure Mr. Uh, the other panelists will talk about it from the Metro Mass Transit point of view, but the other biggest challenge, which Salili already raised, is the range anxiety and, and how far these buses uh, can travel. Bear in mind that the consideration is to look at both inter and intracity services, but uh, for the intracity services, yes, with some level of planning and, and uh, charging and systems deployment, you're able to uh, sustain it. But the key question is how do you then sustain an intercity operation based on range and how far they can travel? So these are key questions that we keep, we keep asking. Now for the government of Ghana to make EVs uh, work, work for us, our consideration have been to look at the institutions, what reforms, what measures can we introduce in order to make, make work. We have to look our, at our custom procedures, uh, taxation procedure, fiscal and non-fiscal incentives, what can be done. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the cost of an e is so high. And this is the main determinant of any private entity wanting to venture into e -bus. We have a taxation system that tend to rather punish anyone who wants to go into clean mobility. And this is something, this is like a, 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 a policy mismatch, which, which needs to be addressed. And we are proposing to government that they, they do some considerations on what level of uh, support can come in terms of the incentives and tax, uh, tax waiver. 
we also need to come out with some uh, guidelines and standards uh, for the introduction of EVs. Um, already we have some EVs coming in and you will notice that basically you need some level of standards in order to, to protect your market. Uh, we have them coming from uh, Asia, Europe, I mean across the group and Ghana with our position, we tend to get more of the used EVs coming. Uh, uh, initially, I wanted to say that we have about 90% of our vehicles being imported used. And therefore, we also foresee that in the short to medium term, we'll have a lot of used EVs coming in. And that's the more reason why you need to develop standards, systems, and procedures to one, protect your market and to see what type of vehicles are coming into your system. Clearly, there are very cheap EVs around, but in terms of safety, uh, safety purposes, it's, it's very dangerous. And, and therefore, if, if you don't uh, put in the necessary measures, uh, we'll have another issue at hand whilst trying to green our mobility systems. Um, on the operator side, I did say that they are very unorganized and therefore any attempt at formalizing the operations, looking at uh, how they can even go in and take bank loans to, to run their operations is, is, is a very challenging one. And I think as a first step, we need to see how we can bring them together uh, from some form of solid entities, cooperatives, so that they can run as a, as a business entity that have it books that can be audited and verifiable by banks. I think these are basic things that have to be done to, to make them a bit attractive to any uh, in, investor. Another point I want to also raise is, 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 is the revenue collection system. And, and, and for us, because the services are run by uh, individuals who do high and reward services. Um, it's really difficult trying to have a formalized fair collection system. Um, ideally, a central fair collection system will give us a very pool of, I mean, it will limit the risks associated with an investment in the EV space once you're able to centralize the, the, the fair collection system. And quite frankly, uh, there's really limited capacity in terms of, uh, from the artisanal point of view, the operations and maintenance of, of, of these vehicles. Uh, these are key issues that we, we need to confront head on. Uh, locally, people, most of our artisans are used to the conventional ICE engines, and therefore any uh, new mode, there's a hybrid, uh, fully electric vehicles and the rest poses a big challenge in terms of how they are able to provide after sales service support. So these are things that uh, we need to start working with our uh, educational institutions, the, the garages and, and the workshops to try and start building capacity of these local operators uh, to, to, to run. Then uh, uh, to conclude, I think in terms of technology and infrastructure challenges, um, we, we need to focus more on the financing aspect because uh, it's, it's very expensive and for you to make it more attractive, you also need to provide some attractive financing for, for especially the operators and, and operators to, to, to come on board. Can we look at some concessional facilities with a, a very long term pay, payment period that is a bit cheap and attractive for the private uh, operator to, to come on board. Can we look at some blend financing for, for the operator? Can we also do some uh, infrastructure in collaboration with the private sector? And what facilities government can take on board? Already for us, uh, we've started some partnership with the uh, private sector in terms of deployment of charging infrastructure, but the pace is, is really low. Uh, we need to look at the tariffs and whether we could have some negotiated tariffs with, 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 with the utility service providers and then 
at least provide very affordable energy to uh, the, the, the operators. Um, I think to top it or to top it all, we need some dedicated facilities to make e-bus work. E-bus in general traffic conditions uh, due to the stop and go mechanisms, uh, I think uh, um, will be very challenging uh, if they are to stop at each traffic light and be in a mixed traffic. It will be very hard for them to even break even considering the initial investment that they have to make. So we need some level of dedicated facilities, which I think is good that we start uh, some development of uh, dedicated bus lanes. I mean, create an infrastructure that is attractive and tender it out to, to whoever wants to invest, invest in it. And then uh, finally, we look at um, the other incentive in terms of the tax-free issues, uh, some subsidies coming up. Bear in mind that we also do have to look at the economics of it and its impact on other sources in terms of uh, revenue generation uh, from program. So, so Rahu, uh, to 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 in brief, these are my my comments for now. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. I think uh, you covered pretty much all the barriers which will make uh, e-buses adoption very difficult, uh, uh, Daniel. Uh, I, I would pose a question, uh, uh, one correction, Daniel, in your point. I think uh, you said that the stop and braking uh, point uh, brings, makes e-bus little disadvantage. In fact, it is the other way around that, right? So if you are running an IC bus in a crowded place with low speed and there are a lot of stops, brakes, and they are keeping the engine on uh, at a uh, stopping at a traffic uh, light, they will actually be emitting more. They will be consuming more fuel and emitting more. E-buses, it's actually the advantage point for them. Like uh, they, they will be efficient uh, when you stop, but the engine is on, the motor is not running, so actually you are not consuming. Uh, so they are uh, better placed uh, than diesel vehicles for such a stop and uh, uh, crawling kind of a traffic situation, Daniel. But overall, I think uh, your points very well taken, Daniel. Like these are some of the challenges. Uh, I would just want to put a very simple uh, question to you, Daniel, and then we'll move to the next colleague and come back. Uh, this feasibility study that was undertaken jointly by us uh, kind of give intracity and intercity. 75 fleet size for intracity and 25 for intercity. If we keep intercity out and just focus on intracity, uh, now that there is a very detailed feasibility done, but it is hugely banking upon the national government extending some upfront clear subsidies, right? And that makes a little bit better route for the international community and climate financing. I think Subhash will talk more. Uh, to kind of extend those kind of concessional facilities. But uh, each of these facilities themselves are looking for uh, that kind of a commitment for national government. So how is government of Ghana positioned uh, or thinking about extending those required uh, uh, tax exemptions, uh, red, uh, exemptions or reduction of the uh, uh, electricity fare so those kind of measures, how, how is government of Ghana kind of uh, thinking about it? At least for yes, this Rahul, pilot. So, uh, um, thank you very much. And yeah, at least for this pilot, uh, can this be extended uh, in a uh, forward, fast forward manner? Uh, uh, so that the execution of the pilot and international community kind of coming together for financing the remaining expects, is that something doable or it has to wait for a longer decision and legislation approvals uh, for a broader uh, EBUS uh, fiscal incentives? Uh, okay, um, thank you, Rahu. And, and, and uh, just to be more specific, I think for this EBAS uh, feasibility, uh, because this is a project that the government of Ghana is pursuing, our intent is that this project will fully benefit for 
the tax exemptions. But the broader scope is to look at all other IBAs coming. Because for this project, yes, it's going to be, uh, there will be some waivers in terms of the taxes and the rest. But with, in terms of the broader scope, uh, looking at other interventions coming in, you need uh, a solid framework to, to guide them. Um, what we have traditionally done, but in the case of the Metro Mass uh, Transit, I'm sure Engineer Taki will come on board. What we've particularly done, even for the ICEs, we give them tax exemptions for them to come. And so uh, having exemptions for the EBAS uh, will not be an issue. The focus is, is, is to think broadly on the other modes coming up and then what support can be given. Already there's a committee in place with the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Transport, the Energy Commission, uh, the Ghana uh, Revenue Authority, all on board. We, we, we are now looking at what waivers can we grant in general. So it's not just for this particular project, but we are looking at in general, all others in terms of EVs, what waivers can be done. And once uh, I'm sure uh, we, we're looking at within the, uh, the coming month, we should be able to come up with a position on what waivers can, can be granted within the scope. And just to say that already within our automotive manufacturing policy, there's a zero rating of imported uh, parts for assembly in Ghana already. This is something that is already existing. So it's, 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 it's not new. So you can always leverage on that uh, framework. If you want to come within the EV space, you can always leverage on that uh, framework. Thank you, Raul. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, we look forward for uh, those finalization of uh, incentives and waivers from the government. So I think that will definitely be a very good starter for a lot of EV projects outside EBUS as well. Uh, let me now request uh, uh, David Teki. David, can you, David, can you uh, turn on your camera, please? And also confirming you are able to hear us and we can uh, see you. Hello, David. Can you confirm that uh, we are able to hear you and you are able to hear us? Engineer David Taki from MMTL. Uh, it looks like it's having some difficulty uh, with that because he initially wanted me to confirm, but I'm unable to, I'm unable to see him online. So it looks like it's some technical difficulty. No worries. So I think uh, let me move forward. But uh, David, uh, if you are able to uh, speak, uh, please let us know and uh, I will come back to you. Let me then uh, uh, continue with uh, uh, dear friend Subhash, Subhash Dhar from UNEP Triple C. Uh, Subhash, uh, you have been involved in multi country projects, especially with focus on sustainability, uh, climate mitigations, adaptations. Uh, how do you see electric bus uh, as an application uh, towards broader greening and uh, its climate financing uh, uh, positioning? Uh, who, who are these players uh, who are ready and willing to look into uh, funding such projects like what we have developed together, uh, the pilot for uh, e-buses in uh, Accra at Khana, uh, Subhash? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Rahul. I would like to first of all thank uh, the speakers earlier, both Ernest and uh, Daniel, with whom we work very closely for this uh, project. And I hope we can uh, continue with our engagement in future also, in terms of seeing that what we have started eventually reaches some kind of a conclusion in terms of action on the ground. So in terms of the first part, your question, you have uh, two parts. Uh, uh, one is the relevance of e-buses or electric mobility in 
uh, generally addressing you can say sustainability concerns or climate concerns and all that. And the other is who is there with the money in his pockets to finance this kind of thing. So, so I will start with the first. You see, I participated uh, also in the recently concluded uh, sixth assessment of IPCC, and I was the lead author for the transport sector. And we were looking at uh, a wide variety of technologies uh, for decarbonization of the transport sector. Now, these vary from uh, sector to sector. And when we are talking here, we are basically we can we can we can say that we are looking at uh, e-mobility in the context of road transport because there is aviation, there is shipping, there is rail-based transport. So there can be electrification happening in different modes. So when we talk of e-mobility, we generally assume here that the discussion is more about road transportation. And especially like when we are talking of the uh, Ghana study, it is more in the urban context. So we are talking of city challenges of congestion, which Ernest was raising and all that. Uh, so in our conclusion from this assessment in IPCC was that electric mobility uh, offers one of the greatest, you can say, potentials for reduction of CO2 emissions from road transport. But there are some caveats. First is that electricity should be green, or you cannot have a coal-based power plant producing electricity, and then you are having electric buses. Then it is not low carbon. In fact, it can be even worse than uh, in that scenario than running a diesel bus. An efficient diesel bus can do a better job in that scenario than that. So electrification and uh, making the electricity green and then electrification of the transportation go hand in hand. Uh, so so let's keep these things, uh, I think, these things together because sometimes we uh, almost forget that electricity, the electric, electric bus is as green as the electricity on which it is running. So that was the first part of your question, I think, um, uh, which was dealing with, uh, so I confirm, yes, electric buses, uh, have a role and have a not a small role. I have a major role to play. And as you were presenting, also in Europe, China and some countries in Europe are also taking it quite seriously. And we have a lot of now electric buses on the ground. So it is not a technology which uh, has not been proven. It's a now proven technology, but definitely in the context of Ghana and developing countries, it's still not the case. And the reason came, I think, very clearly from what Daniel was mentioning, and that is the cost. Especially as uh, Rahul, you know more than uh, anyone else, is that these costs for electric modes, uh, electric, uh, you can say, vehicles change with the size of the vehicles. The smaller the vehicle, they are almost cost, cost competitive, like electric two wheelers, electric three wheelers. I don't think there is any discussion about giving a subsidy for them because they have become cost competitive. But when we come to buses, then electric buses are quite expensive, especially if we want to give the same level of service. And if we want to also, you can say, uh, yeah, if you want to give the same level of service, you could be having, because bus in its nomenclature is also different kinds of buses. Like we could have a very small mini bus, then the case may be the very different from a bus, which is like a 12 meter bus, if, if you are talking of. So that is the other part. Uh, yeah, so the, the costs are very high. And therefore, um, so I would not start saying that let's find now somebody who can give us grants and concessional loans and the job is done. I think the long term sustainability will involve uh, improving uh, the business case for these buses. And uh, I, my understanding is that it requires doing at least uh addressing it three, in three different ways one i would say is a technology driven way is that when we are and, and i think this is what we did in ghana also we had this intracity intercity two different you can say bus routes we were looking at so uh you can see that for these two different routes the costs are very different and in fact for some of the viewers who are joining us they can also look at uh, these uh, market feasibility studies uh, which are now in the public domain. And you can see that the cost structures are quite different for both of these cases. We require a much bigger battery and much more expensive one. 
when we are looking at the intercity route, whereas for the intercity route, it's relatively much more inexpensive. Even if we focus more on the intercity part, there could be variations in the way we operate these, uh, you can say, buses. Uh, like if we are using a smaller battery, but also combining it with opportunity charging, then there is a possibility that we may spend a little bit more on the charging infrastructure, but at the same time, we may save a lot on the battery cost. And charging infrastructure are relatively more long term. So if you look into the total cost of ownership of these buses, then that may come out a little bit lower than using a much bigger battery size. So looking at their project, looking at your use case and designing a technology solution, in a more optimist, uh, 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 in an optimized fashion, can be the first thing to do in these particular cases. Second thing is that we need to also think in terms of the business models which we are using for for this. Uh, like when I say business models, I am I am referring to the fact that like we can think of. Uh, you can say buying these buses outrightly from 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 some manufacturer and then uh, running it in them in the city. But it could also mean that we uh, come up with uh, more, you can say, a model where they, these buses are kind of leased to the operators, which can basically help in overcoming the upfront capital, uh, uh, operating, uh, this capital cost issue for the operators. Uh, there could be other ways, I would not go into that, but there could be other ways of doing. The third issue is uh, is that electric buses, uh, like if you look at Ghana, uh, there, there is this, uh, you can say a lot of number of private sector operators are running these buses or small, you can say different modes of transport. So how do we make the fare box? Because looking at the fare box collection, in fact, Daniel alluded to that using some kind of a mechanism so that there's a centralized ticketing and fare collection. So that those risks associated with fare box collection are reduced. But I would like to add here that not only making the ticketing automated or uh, centralized, we should be also looking at the ways in which we improve the last mile connectivity for the users of these buses. So how do we improve the access to these buses? So we may be focusing on the electric buses here, but the, the, the key here is also to improve the overall running operational efficiency of the buses so that the full fare box collection go up. And in that way also, we reduce the amount of subsidies and incentives we're looking for. That was more uh, on the financing side, but more looking at how we make the uh, you can say the project more viable to begin with. Who can provide the financing? Now, uh, this was mentioned by earlier speakers also, we need some kind of concessional and ground-based financing. So to my mind, I think from the UNEP side, uh, uh, UNEP is already in discussions with Ministry of Transport, for example, of providing financing or developing a project proposal using the JEF funding. But here, the caveat is that this kind of funding which is relatively small and it can be provided for some kind of a pilot of with some some few buses to demonstrate what is the, the business model and the technology solution that is being provided but it cannot be used on a very large scale so large scale funding has to go beyond jeff but definitely some kind of a initial piloting can be done, done using uh, funding which is largely grant-based financing from the JEF side. GCF uh, is the next, I would like to say, uh, has, been, has shown some appetite for funding, uh, you can say electric mobility. Uh, in fact, in July itself, I was seeing uh, that GCF has funded a very large e-mobility uh, project in Latin America, around 450 million US dollars. And, uh, and this is more for uh, public entities, funding the public entities who are engaged in electric mobility. But this year has also shown the inclination to uh, set up funds for electric mobility, which can be directly providing finance to the private sector. Uh, for example, in case of India, there is a GCF uh, project now approved for more than 1 billion uh, from Macquarie 
ऑस्ट्रेलियन बेस्ड फंडिंग एंटिटी विच वो भी डायरेक्टली सपोर्टिंग प्राइवेट ऑपरेटर्स बोथ फॉर व्हीकल्स एंड बोथ फॉर चार्जिंग इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर so gcf has shown an appetite and i think ghana is also keen to develop a gcf proposal the only challenge is how we package it but because because in this case in the case of gcf i don't think it would be uh, only grant funding which we have to look at because the gcf can provide some small amount of grant funding but it is largely loan or maybe at the maximum for some concessional loan which can which can be given to into the play I think uh, I think I answered both of your questions with that. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Subhash, uh, for kind of bringing the potential options. Uh, many of these options, like GCF, JF, uh, has fairly high component of technical advisory and fairly lower portion of uh, actual investments to go right uh, they can yeah. fund kind of pilots so i think the latin america and india pilot that you uh, so the the the, the fundings uh, of 450 million to 1 billion from gcf in uh, latin and uh, uh, india i think those are good kind of a models to really bring uh, right kind of financing for either public or private entity uh, uh, into the assets so i think uh, that is uh, something definitely that that is very much required uh, daniel if i may uh, continue from the point of uh, subhash uh, how has been discussion uh, uh, at your level with right kind of investors either public investors private investors or the multilaterals uh, in their interest to kind of uh, support Ghana uh, with piloting some of the first use cases, including e buses. So, any kind of uh, uh, good progress that uh, you see with any of our discussions already? I think, as part of this project, there is a feasibility study plus there is a GCF concept note that was prepared, uh, uh, Daniel. So, do you think like uh, that is fairly ready to go to the next step, uh, or already in that phase, and you are kind of seeing either questions or already kind of uh, interest uh, in the international community to support on uh, such pilots? Yes, um, Rahul, thank you, and and uh, just just to add that, uh, I think Subhash has raised it. Uh, <clears throat> With the concept note that has been developed, um, we're looking at yes, GCF financing, but but we know GCF in terms of it, uh, what it's able to give. Yes, there will be some level of grants, but more of it will, will come in the terms of loans. And we, we see this as, as the way forward. Yes, there's some level of uh, subcomponent that we need, but the big chunk is, 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 is the loans that will be coming in. And the loan, we, we're looking at very uh, concessional facilities in terms of maybe coming from some ESIM bank facilities. Um, you, you could have even AFRI ESIM or AFDB or, I mean, the World Bank coming in, the, the potential financiers. But uh, the bottom line is you need a credit facility that is affordable to, to the operator and, and that is a discussion um, with the gcf process because, can i go ahead one, uh, yes i'm trying to see if i uh, can hear me clear this, this is uh, david taki uh, oh, representing I'm the Great, great, David. We can hear you. Uh, Daniel is just finishing a point, David. I will uh, come to you after that point. But uh, great that you are able to make, uh, David. So just uh, give well. a few minutes. Yeah, thank you, David. Sorry, oh. Daniel, go ahead. Yes, so, so with the GCF uh, concept you know, that was recently developed, we, we need to also go a bit, a step further. Uh, try and uh, green more or less the system requirements. System requirements, um, 
I'm referring to the energy requirement and, and all that because for, for us, for us, uh, we have a fairly missed energy requirement. We have some from thermal sources, we have some from hydro, we have a mixture of uh, a renewable energy that's solar. Uh, it's, it's, with the GCL process, at least they need to see the whole scope and then what savings we are making in terms of the environmental savings. And that's why we need to go a bit further and try and even come up with further studies on greening the national grid. And that's what we are currently working on. Now. And I want to use and thank Subash very much for uh, his support. He's been very key. On, on, on this. So that's the next phase of, of the project uh, we are uh, going, going ahead with. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. And just related to that, any specific private interest, uh, Daniel, like country like India has seen uh, a good interest from the private uh, industry players uh, because of a huge uh, signal of demand. Uh, aggregated by a right government entity of the order of 5,000 plus e-buses demand across different uh, cities. Uh, Indian manufacturers and also competing international uh, OEMs, they were able to really compete at a rate where they were able to provide a dollar per kilometer uh, uh, GCC contracts with e-bus uh, at a price even lower than uh, diesel buses. I'm sure like there's a journey to go where does Ghana stands in terms of its PTs, in terms of its contract uh, enforcements and risks. But uh, is that also an option that uh, some private players would have approached uh, government of Ghana in terms of expressing their interest to provide such uh, GCC contracts and they bring in the investments of course facilitated by some kind of a custom duty waivers or something which is easy for the government but then they taking all the technology risk and what they need are those assured kilometers on a daily basis and uh, hopefully through the centralized payment ticketing mechanism that you were pointing daniel they able to kind of uh, get that uh, 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 confirmation or assurance on uh, uh, their leasing value being getting paid so is that a model that you believe that uh, uh, Ghana uh, is worthy exploring for Ghana? That can solve yes, some of the uh, gaps that you face otherwise uh, in terms of organizing international financing, uh, uh, which may take, has its own time and a uh, lot of other requirements, uh, Daniel. Yes, um, well, we, we've had some proposals in, in the past um, in, and uh, just to be more specific, even with the ICEs, those are the arrangement that uh, we've been having with, with most of the players. So you have them coming in with some form of uh, buyer's credit or a supplier's credit, and then the uh, government take up these facilities and, and, and it's, 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 it's paid over time. More or less, government take up these facilities and it's online to, 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 to the operators. So that has been the arrangement. Just that in the case of EVs, because we are still working on, on the policy framework, the regulations and the rest, is is the, the, the way forward is really not clear. And 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 that's the process we are going through now to have a clear roadmap on, on how you want to transition on the E and the EV market. So that is really something that government is keen on, on taking up. Sure, great. I think uh, that's a very good point, Daniel, that uh, those right kind of policies and commitment of government to see those policies getting enforced strongly contractually, it will give a lot of uh, comfort uh, to the businesses, uh, to the industry, to the multilaterals for uh, 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 extending better support uh, and taking more uh, uh, investments uh, to Ghana. So that's that's a good point. Uh, David, uh, uh, welcome. Uh, if you are able to turn on your camera, great. But otherwise, uh, David, uh, we would like to hear uh, yours and MMTL's perspective uh, about the uh, excitement uh, 
post completion of this study and learning like what e buses can do but also what e buses cannot do right there are some challenges while there are some clear leverages uh, how do you see as an operator uh, practicality of uh, doing this first pilot and uh, mmtl's willingness to go forward uh, the pilot to do more so what what are some things that uh, you are really hopeful that uh, ebus transition can uh, bring to uh, mmtl and the city of accra in ghana david David, can you hear me? Okay, I think we are still facing issues with uh, David uh, and able to hear. Uh, maybe my uh, last question, Daniel, to you. Uh, you already talked about the importance of policy, importance of bringing the right uh, institutional structures uh, for PT bus operations and regulations. Uh, so one important point like between a national entity uh, doing a kind of BRT support uh, at city level uh, and another kind of a uh, city entity uh, kind of working. So how do you see uh, going forward, uh, Khana cities kind of uh, taking a right institutional structure between city local government and uh, national government working rightly collaboratively uh, for right kind of a mix of bus systems. Like if it has to be BRT and non-BRT together uh, with right kind of other uh, Protos also, they also have some importance into the last mile to the bus systems. Uh, how, how do you see or envisage that kind of an institutional structure at a city level, national and city kind of working uh, together? Because that will pave a right kind of a way for e-buses also to come and uh, uh, start uh, solving the uh, urban issues of uh, people. Yes, um, Rahul. Yes, thank you. And uh, just, just to say that you need for, for the Ministry of Transport, our responsibility is mainly on policy development and, and formulation and, and that ends it. You need uh, those on the ground to do the implementation. At the city level, um, here too, there was no, uh, in fact, the capacity in terms of transport was very limited. But um, over the past few years, uh, we've started creating transport departments within the city uh, authorities. Um, nationally, we have about 16 administrative capitals. And all these 16 administrative capitals have their sub-metros and, uh, and, and municipal assemblies. Now, the regulations and, and management of urban I mean, transport happens at the local level. And once you don't have those strong institutions to ensure that um, they're able to transcend the policies into action, it then becomes uh, an issue. So yes, uh, you will need that anchor body at, at the local level to, to do that. What we have done now is to set up a, more or less a road transport authority or a regulator for the road transport industry and they are coming up with all the guidelines the standards the procedures uh, i mean what have you on, on on how public transport should be operated so yes i believe they they will also come up with some of these system requirements in terms of yes if there's a route to be tendered out to operators what services do we require? Do we require e bus What percentage do, do we want on those corridors and all that? Yes. So it's something that uh, the government of Ghana is, is keen on working on. We've already started, but there's the need to beef up capacity to, to make them uh, perform better. Over to you, Rahul. 
Thank you very much, Daniel. I think it has been very lovely to uh, have you, uh, Daniel, and uh, other panelists in this very, very important and valuable exchange. Uh, I think uh, many other participants who are coming cross country from Africa and from other countries and cities. Uh, I think the important message is like uh, e-buses with green electricity, both thing in right sync, I think is that's how we should kind of look into the first pilots, the first deployments needs a more systematic uh, uh, planning, uh, a rigorous planning so that uh, we don't face issues later on and delay the implementation parts and uh, a right kind of uh, synergies at national level uh, because it's typically the national level entity working with multilaterals in right kind of sovereign guarantees to bring their interests and first climate financing including grants uh, for executing the first pilots and uh, the local stakeholders the local uh, government uh, needs to be really involved in deployment and I think there are already kind of good uh, benchmarks and business models that are existing where in addition to external capital and subsidies, uh, private capital uh, and separation of assets, separation of batteries, separation of charging infrastructure, all these things rightly leveraged with a uh, uh, concessional facility can really bring the right implementations and forward to the scale up of EVSS. So I, 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 I think with that strong messaging, I again want to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, all the participants for your very important uh, uh, contribution. There were questions. I was trying to include a lot of your questions in the questions that I was uh, posing to the speakers. Some of the questions I may have missed. Uh, uh, we are happy if you can write to us. We will try to respond them. I also want to kind of tell you that uh, at P Manifold, with our commitments to strengthen uh, EV ecosystem, uh, we have uh, EV Acad, our academy. We are running uh, a special EV system planning uh, program for last two plus years now. I have trained almost 200 plus global professionals how to go for systematic uh, e-bus planning. So a lot of things that Saili was talking and demonstrating for Ghana feasibility. That is something that we'll be very happy to kind of uh, 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 teach you in a very applied form so that you can take it and we are able to do a lot of uh, good work across. So this batch is uh, planned for in September. Uh, if anyone is interested, feel free to write to us, me, Saili. We'll be happy to take it up from there. And Daniel, like uh, from our side, P Manifold, UNEP, Triple C, we remain committed to work with you, Government of Ghana, to really take this feasibility study uh, to a next step of also implementation, Daniel. So, uh, in that regard, uh, you have all our support. Uh, let us know what more we can be undertaking, and especially with capacity building, Daniel, like this is something an easy thing that we can start in uh, parallel so with the right kind of a national institute in uh, ghana which could be university of ghana we can actually start uh, working and building uh, uh, capacities uh, around uh, evs design repair maintenance manufacturing and planning so i think uh, that is one step we can already take together so thank you again, everyone, for all your uh, uh, hearing and uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Daniel. Thank you, Saili. Thank you, Subhash. Uh, David, we cannot hear you. Sorry. Apologies. Uh, and uh, thank you, Ernest. Thanks a lot, guys. Okay, bye. Thank you.